Good morning. Um, today's uh, first lecture in this room is about virtualization. Thank you for coming. Uh, in the beginning, I thought uh, I will have this talk uh, with an empty room because it's day four and, well, we are all tired. So thank you again for coming. So what's, um, what's about virtualization? I mean, virtualization is a, a technique you can use uh, in, in computing for a broad field of applications. And of course, we are a hacker conference. So I'm trying to give you an introduction, uh, like a, a sneak preview in the techniques of virtualization. So beginning, uh, first question which arrives is of course, what's virtualization? Um, virtualization is a framework or a methodology of dividing the resources of a computer into multiple execution environments. Means you part the time, the bandwidth, everything which is inside a computer or can be accessed into small parts and give them away. Okay, what, uh, what techniques are we using there? Uh, first, you probably think, uh, yeah, well, I'm doing that the same at my home because uh, my NEOS insert uh, does concurrent uh, time sharing, gives the hard disks to other processes. So that's, that's quite fine. But virtualization is about uh, running uh, multiple operating system at the same time. So, what can we do with it? Of course, the field of application for virtualization is quite broad. Um, in a business meaning, first thing ever uh, mentioned is of course server consolidation. You can put all of your 20 boxes into a few ones. And of course, this is good for business, this is good for uh, administration. You can run your legacy applications. I mean, there are always some old, uh, I don't know, uh, MS-DOS programs. And you have that specific application built on it. And first, you need a hardware on top uh, of you would like to run it. This is um, becoming more difficult uh, anytime the PC is uh, advancing. Uh, wow, okay. Uh, so you put it in the box. And this box is an idealist machine. And you run this box on a real box. So that's, that's about uh, legacy applications. Of course, web browsing always gets uh, more insecure. So what can you do with virtualization in this field? You simply put a box, meaning a virtualized hardware, <laughs> a virtualized operating system, and a browser. And you can safely browse through the internet. If something happens, it happens inside the box. As soon as you're finished, reset it. So, for instance, Firmware has uh, recently announced uh, the Firmware Player, I think. And there are pre-built images you, you can use exactly for this task. Just browse, use Firefox in a virtual machine, 
don't be afraid of some viruses or worms or whatever. Of course, application mobility means uh, virtualization gives us the power to move machines and, of course, the applications running on top of it from one machine to another. So that's quite cool because if you want to maintain that server, and of course there's one uh, critical application running on it, just move it to another server. Testing and debugging environments, always good to have a deep look inside the operating system while it is running. It's always a little bit complicated if you um, are working on this system. So it's a handy tool to get into a system without uh, having the, the hassles of, well, something went wrong. Okay, I have to reboot my, my machine. You can make clean single application, single service environments. I mean, you don't have to, to set up your egg laying, uh, egg -laying uh, eier legende Wollmilch, so. Okay, German native speakers would understa understand this. <laughs> Basically an animal which gives you everything you want. You don't, uh, I mean it's good, but on the other hand, on, uh, on the other hand uh, it's quite complicated to administer. So if you separate every reasonable service from each other, you have small machines with a quite clean to understand and easy to maintain. Nevertheless, uh, the things businessmen always uh, try to hammer in your brain what virtualization can make to you. It also gives you the freedom of choice in using multiple operating systems at once. Maybe uh, you don't need this, but it's handy in case, okay, this program doesn't work on this platform, but I have another platform running, and uh, well, I have three platforms running on my iBook, and it's okay, I can choose whatever application I want uh, on the whatever operating system I want. It's also a soft, I call it soft uh, user migration path. So you migrate the user from one operating system to another. The point is, yeah, at one time you must switch over and uh, it, maybe it helps if you can run Linux for the first time in a box on, your, on top of your Windows machine and get a little bit used to it without having the Tesla. And it has to be the only operating system and stuff like that. Last but not least, virtualization is funny. I mean, at least for me. <laughs> okay. Um, next thing, what I want to talk about is a little bit of theory. Don't bother, it won't, won't be long. I mean, at least five minutes. Afterwards, we have some, we are looking how we can achieve the techniques used in virtualization and what is used inside the machine monitor. And afterwards, we have some outlook into the future and uh, what possible could happen in the future, in my opinion. But let's have a look at the theory. Um, some smart people have um, made their brain think 
a little bit more. And they found uh, for a hardware platform, there are three main criteria. If uh, this hardware platform is uh, uh, good for virtualization, so the first method is executing uh, non privileged uh, instructions must be the must have the same binary form in user mode or in system mode this is a quite easy easy one most architectures uh, fulfill it second there must be a protection system or an address translation system to protect the real system and any other virtual machine from each other. Again, nothing uh, very unusual in modern processor architecture. Third, there must be a way to automatically signal the virtual machine monitor. The virtual machine monitor, by the way, is that thing that runs on top of the hardware and that coordinates which machine now runs and has probably access to the hardware. So there must be a way to automatically signal the FIM, the virtual machine monitor, when a uh, virtual machine attempts to execute a sensitive instruction. So what's a sensitive instruction? Basically everything which alters the state of the CPU with alters the state of memory management, protection, and of course, I.O. So, instruction that attempt to change or reference the mode of the uh, virtual machine or the state of the machine. Instructions that read and change sensitive re registers and or memory locations. Storage protection system, memory system, and last but not least, I.O. instructions. So, still does not look uh, very sophisticated. We should uh, do this on the uh, Intel X86. So, there are many people who have looked into it. And, well, most processor architectures today have no problem with the three criteria mentioned before. But, uh, well, x86 is different. There are, <laughs> there are 17 privileged instructions that do not trap into user mode. In user mode, which means trap means if you, if the processor executes these sensitive instructions, for instance, um, switch to another uh, processor mode. Well, you should not do this in user mode. Or at least, if you try this, uh, the processor should uh, raise an exception and the monitor uh, should give him a chance to emulate this, the desired behavior. Also, all seven in instruction violate either part P or part C. That's about um, it's leaking information. So it basically just means it leaks information of the current processor state, which is not bad, but in specific it's bad because uh, uh, programs uh, would like to use this information and would be misguided. So basically, the x86 processor architecture is non virtualization able. Bad news, but uh, mainly my talk is about the x86 processor architecture today. So there are many ways where you can work around. So how to hack around these limitations. And there are plenty of uh, possibilities. The first, change the hardware, 
of course. <laughs> uh, Intel and recently AMD both thought this would be a good idea. Like uh, many other processor architectures have this already. I mean, this 17 instruction this isn't something by design uh, because it's sophisticated or complicated. They just didn't thought about it. Okay. Uh, if you can change the hardware, you can emulate the hardware. You can do dynamic recompilation of the code you are currently running or supposed to, to run. Uh, you can binary rewrite the code, also very dirty and uh, often used in uh, virtualization techniques. Of course, you can port the kernel stuff like uh, user mode Linux does this. Or if you can't uh, port the kernel or port the API because you don't have the source, you can try to emulate the API. There, is, uh, there are some approaches using a microkernel. And last but not least, power virtualization and fractional kernel porting. So, this is basically the techniques this talk is about. Um, we are going to talk about all of these techniques. How, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, all, all of these techniques. And, uh, but before we come to the, to the funny and dirty part of it, we want to have another look at uh, what uh, virtualization monitor, or some, sometimes you call it hypervisor, depending on the implementation, should do for us. So first thing is protection management. It's of course, it's important to seal the virtual and the physical architecture and also important, preventing virtual machines from, interf uh, from interfering <laughs> with each other or the monitor. Sounds reasonable. Of course, they don't have to know from each other. Another part of a uh, machine, machine monitor is resource management. I mean, giving an equal share of CPU, of network, of disk bandwidth. In case of uh, uh, CPU, network, and disk bandwidth, you just time multiplex. A space multiplex uh, example is, of course, the memory. You need some paging support because probably the operating system wants to page a non used application memory out of memory. So you should support this too. Of course, virtualization gives us uh, some things nearly for free. You can save a state of a currently running machine. You can recover the state at any other time and you can migrate it to other machines. This is something uh, that comes for free if you do virtualization. This is quite good. And of course, near to native speed. As uh, I was looking through some implementation papers of virtualization on the x86, uh, I discovered that all virtualization guys are, are Quake players. Um, so it has to be near native speed. <laughs> well, uh, to reach near native speed, a uh, machine monitor should at least, I mean, this is just a, a, a trailer, something like, you need at least fast monitor calls, means if something happens, you want to access the hardware from a virtual machine, you call the hypervisor. This happens quite, uh, quite often, so you need fast calls there 
Also you need fast interrupt handling. Every operating system has some idle instructions. You need to support this also. And of course, chunk writes for I.O. would be quite uh, satisfying in case you need a uh, near to native speed. Um, coming back to the Quake uh, playing, this is from um, Denali, from a, a technical implementation a PDF from Denali, uh, one virtual machine monitor from the Forex 86. And you see, they already measured uh, how many virtual machines of Quake 2, in this case servers, and the throughput they have. Well, um, three years later, uh, there was Quake 3. And this is another virtualization monitor. This is Xen. And of course, <laughs> Xen, the Xen guys are always doing the same. They are also looking if they migrate the Quake 3 server in uh, while, while running, how long uh, would be the downtime? And would this be acceptable for a Quake player? I think 50 milliseconds would be quite, quite good. <laughs> so, virtualization helps playing Quake. Okay, but um, let's have a look at the techniques. First technique is, uh, okay, the hardware change. Some people have uh, made their thoughts about it. So the possibilities are just to change the 17 privileged instruction to trap into user mode and change a little bit of the semantics. Well, would be good because it would be easy to implement if used as a switchable extension, also safe with legacy software. The bad thing about this, it's easy to implement. So, well, I don't know if somebody has tried, but I don't think you can't uh, make a patent on bug fixes. So, of course, you have to invent a new set of instructions and a new mode, and then you can make your new patent. So, basically, it would be sufficient to fix the seven in instructions and everything would be all right. But in case of reality, we need something different. Um, Intel VTX and AMD Pacifica, probably for those who don't know, are extensions of the x86 architecture to work around the limitations of the x86 architecture. <laughs> and they, I mean, if you have a look at the design papers, I had a look at it, it's quite terrific and uh, complicated. But of course, it does what it should do. So, Intel is uh, shipping their new processors with this feature already, uh, mainly in the, in the server, server CPUs, but would take one or two years and it, I think it would be mainstream. Okay, but we don't want to wait two years, so what else can we do? If we have a look at full emulation, I mean, uh, full emulation has its good side and its bad side. Usually the, the bad side of full emulation is it's slow. The good side, you can run whatever box on whatever box means. You can run your Amiga operating system you can run Windows on top of Linux. It doesn't matter. You virtualize every single piece of hardware. 
And uh, as you see here, you're fetching some instructions. You translate them and uh, you execute every single opcode after thinking, what, what should I do with it? And then you update the virtual machine. It definitely has its uh, good, good points. Box is one uh, example of uh, full emulation, virtualization. Uh, of course, you have very good debugging uh, capabilities for this. Uh, the other thing is you need to, to write a lot of, lot of code because you need to write uh, a BIOS, you need to write uh, every single IO device you want to support. But of course, Box is open source. And uh, thanks to Box, uh, many uh, hybrid techniques of virtualization are only usable because uh, Box has made the beginning and wrote uh, many I.O. and BIOS stuff. We will see this stuff in many other products. So full emulation is always a good thing if you want to try out something, but it's slow. Dynamic scan before execute binary rewriting. Uh, yeah, in, in um, yeah, if you look at the slide, um, there's something I want to tell you. Don't try to use LaTeX Beamer to make uh, very graphical slides. You fail. So basically, that's what I tried to do. But now let's have a look at binary rewriting. Binary rewriting is a, is a funny technique because uh, uh, you write into the code while it's running. I mean, that's fantastic, yeah? Uh, it's not like um, uh, database programming or uh, real-time programming, but you do something very precise now, here, here you do 30 tricks and 30, 30 uh, changing opcodes while, while the system is running. Actually, you work around the 17 instructions again. But to work around the 17 instructions first, you must find them. Once you've found them, you put a um, breakpoint exception into it. This is just a one byte opcode, so that's quite easy. If you're trapped there, you know, okay, I'm here. That should be, I remember that should be that instruction. So I emulate these instructions and jump back. But um, you also have to take care about branches. So you must walk, of course, while it's running, I mean, while it is running in, in, in parts of it, walk through the instruction opcodes, look for branches, mark these branches. Uh, if the code jumps into the other side of the branch, okay, you have to, to rewrite and look again what has happened. Do I need to... Uh, examine uh, the, uh, another code segment, or is it just as we expected? So basically, you, you do every, I mean, don't uh, even think about self-modifying code. <laughs> it's, it's terrible with uh, uh, binary rewriting. But uh, binary rewriting is one, was one of the first techniques used in commercial virtualization. For instance, firmware does this in one part of its products. And yeah, as we see, it's working. 
I mean, it's, it's quite fast, but uh, we are far from native speed. And it's, it's really dirty, so we want to do something different. Dynamic recompilation. <laughs> uh, like binary rewriting, but uh, a little bit more tricky. So dynamic recompilation is uh, you pass one opcode, you behave again like the processor, but this time you don't rewrite it or do something because it could be possible, possible uh, a different architecture. Uh, you pass it, you know the instruction, you recode the instruction into small c instruction, and uh, while you keep care about the, the virtualized infrastructure, and then you translate these uh, C instructions again into native meshing code. So this is really funny, <coughs> and uh, because it happens to be quite fast, uh, it's possible to support a different architecture than the host OS. You need only user mode support, so there is no kernel module you, you must load. And uh, it's simple functions. Uh, probably you know QAMO. Yeah, QAMO is one example for dynamic recompilation. And if you look at the progress of QAMO, you see it's working and they it's quite fast in incorporating new processor architectures. So, and it basically it's a one person project. So, <coughs> this is a technique used which is really impressive in its results. Yeah, the bad things on this side is, okay, it's a little bit delicate, <laughs> at least. <laughs> I mean, it's not very dirty, okay? And also, again, you need to some way support self-modifying code. But it works. Yeah, sometimes um, you don't want to make a, a virtualization, a whole virtualization machine. You just want a API emula emulation. Everybody should know about Wine, I think. Um, does everybody know about Wine? Oh, okay. Uh, Wine is a API emulation of the Windows API uh, running on top of Linux. So basically, it means uh, API emulation is. Uh, you have your uh, Windows binary, and of course you want to run it on top of Linux or on top of FreeBSD. Insert your favorite open source uh, operating system here. And to run this uh, Windows binary, well, of course you need Windows, but uh, you don't have Windows. So you need at least uh, the function calls Windows supports. So, and this is where AP emulation uh, begins. You have, uh, of course, beside of the loader and some relocation and other, other small support stuff, you have, yeah, all function calls usually used uh, in win Windows uh, mapped to a library which then calls x11 uh, Linux operating system calls. So this is quite good. And uh, for those who've tr who's, who's, uh, who have already tried this, sometimes, uh, well, it depends on the application, but uh, right now there are many applications working 
and uh, many others are not, uh, don't work. Why? Because, I, I mean, it's quite fast and uh, also it's user space, so you don't need something uh, like a kernel module. But uh, as uh, you, that the Windows binary is expecting uh, exactly the same trash uh, for what it was built, it, is, uh, is it, it expects the same bugs also. So in case you have the source, this is not complicated, but uh, in case you don't, uh, <laughs> it gets really, really, really hard. So you need to emulate every bug uh, found in the system you want to emulate. In case of Windows, uh, maybe you know that there are plenty of bugs. You need to be compatible with any of them. So also, you need to emulate a lot of libraries. And uh, this makes uh, API emulation quite a hassle. You know, but if the program you want to use already works, use it. Uh, the bad thing on the other side is, well, it's uh, hard to secure, especially if we are doing OS emulation. Uh, I want to, to, as I've mentioned before, user mode Linux uh, falls in the field of OS emulations. That means um, you're basically taking the Linux kernel. I mean, user mode Linux is already integrated into the kernel and uh, wrap around the hardware. And instead of uh, writing to real hardware, you are just uh, writing to a Linux kernel. So you need to remap uh, the hardware access to functions and the, all the OS calls the applications want to call must be remapped to the real OS. Uh, this is quite hard to secure, and uh, probably in for speed you need a kernel module. But uh, user mode Linux is working, and it has its field of application. But we have other approaches also. Well, um, this is maybe not... Uh, wide known as an approach for virtualization. I mean, microkernels are, of course, well known to plenty of you. But uh, firmware used this approach. And I think uh, it's firmware ESX or GSX. I um, always swap these two. I think it's ESX, I mean, enterprise something. And um, in firmware ESX, they did something different. Uh, the guys from Xen uh, tried it also, they failed. Well, I mean, it's a, a good approach to take a microkernel which has a built in uh, possibility to rewrite operating system calls from one flavor to another. I mean, you need at least a forever operating system flavor call. You need a management API. But basically, it's, it's, it's good and it's easy. So you have, here it's probably a little bit unclear. But um, in this case, you have at least two translation APs, one translating from Linux's calls to the microkernel and one translating from one, uh, Windows uh, syscalls to the microkernel. Well, it's a very clean implementation and uh, it's fast. But uh, why did the open source project fail in, 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 in this implementation? You need lots of code. It 
tasks, especially you need every device driver. Uh, you know, probably if you have looked at the at the kernel code of Linux, you will see that most of the code lines are drivers of devices. So basically, and hardware is changing fast. So, I mean, at Fineway somehow they did manage to to make it, but. Uh, there is no open source implementation of this because uh, you need to write a lot of, lot of, lot of device driver and after half a year you need to write new ones. So, let's come to power virtualization. Power virtualization, the most prominent uh, example of this is Xen, is making a little bit of different approach if we can't virtualize the hardware because of some minor bugs into the hardware, uh, okay, we work around these minor bugs not in emulating it, not in binary rewriting it. No, we change the operating system and just in small pieces. So basically we, we want an ideal hardware uh, where every single access to the hardware is going to a management AP in the, in the monitor, in the virtual machine monitor. And we don't want to write drivers, so we are using the host OS to pipe the drivers to guest OS, the data to guest OS, and uh, we just need a thin, very thin layer of virtualization between the real hardware because uh, we modified the operating system not to call the hardware direct because uh, we want to call the machine monitor instead. So the good thing, this is if Im implemented right, this is very fast. Also, it's capable, scalable. <laughs> mean, you have uh, a linear overhead. And uh, the hardware support, of course, is easy. You're using your host OS for it. On the bad side, uh, you need a modified kernel and means you won't. Uh, there, there was uh, in the in the lab there was a Windows uh, version. They modified, and didn't take so long. But uh, in reality, Microsoft or commercial operating systems have no real um, fun about uh, running on top of uh, open source. <laughs> operating system, so that won't happen, even if it's not complicated. And uh, comparing to the microkernel approach, probably forgot in the last slide, there is also one difference on the bad side. In the microkernel approach, of course, you have your device drivers, you're doing all the stuff by yourself. Here, if the host or one hardware domain crashes, well, every other domain which needs uh, data from this hardware domain is also halted. And uh, this is was, uh, what's uh, coming up next in the next few months. I mean, it's already running, but uh, you don't get a hardware for it. You can, of course, combine power virtualization with virtualization. Uh, as soon as the hardware gets better. Uh, there are a few differences between the power virtualization, full virtualization, and full virtualization. Of course, you need something like a BIOS, a BIOS, and of course you need some I.O. emulated. 
even if you don't use it all over the time because there are device drivers where you can pipe it through the machine monitor to a hardware domain. Uh, you want to boot unmodified OS, so you need a lot of things. Uh, well, Box, again, did many of this code because of the BIOS, and QEMO did a lot of I.O. emulation. So what the exam people thought was, well, let's put uh, the new hardware change, uh, the BIOS of Box, and the I.O. emulation of QEMO together, and of course Xen. And basically then you have uh, full virtualization with li linear overhead and near native speed. Uh, 10 minutes, uh, probably I will skip that one. Um, yeah, you see here is a short overview. It actually scales. <laughs> uh, So what we have seen today on different types of virtualization techniques is emulation, box, dynamic recompilation, QMO, kernel porting, AP emulation, power virtualization, and full virtualization. And of course there are some, always uh, some kind of hybrid techniques. But you see uh, virtualization on the x8, 80, uh, 68 platform. <laughs> I think it's day four. I, I really feel it. Uh, there are a lot of products and uh, there are lots of working products. And most of them are open source. So, what should we do with it? So, let's. Um, have a look at the future. If everything is uh, evolving in the way it, uh, it looks, um, in my opinion, uh, soon a virtualization monitor will become part of a standard bootloader. So maybe it would not be the standard bootloader of, of Windows or maybe not the standard bootlet of, of Mac OS, but uh, at some stage it will be a standard bootloader, meaning uh, you have always virtualization on board if you need it or not, but uh, if you want to start a virtual machine, whatever you run uh, on top of it, you will be able to. A little bit... Um, more advanced, but not so far in the future. Um, Linux, PSD, and React OS. React OS, uh, for you, you don't uh, probably. Uh, React OS is a um, Windows uh, NT kernel clone, uh, which is progressing quite good. I mean, it's not finished as most open source products or any, any other product. <laughs> Um, but it can run already a couple of applications and the interesting point in this case, it's of course uh, very easy to port it to run under the Xen hypervisor and interesting thing, it can run Windows drivers. So what do you want to do with uh, your laptop uh, wireless card, well, most of the time you choose to run Windows because there is no driver for it under Linux. Yeah, in the upcoming future, there is no need for Windows, Linux, or whatever. If there is a driver in either Windows 
or in Linux or in FreeBSD, you use it as a hardware domain and uh, put multiple hardware domains, each having a, a specific piece of hardware under control together and run it uh, probably a third or fourth operating system where you, you will be doing your real work. So the NEOS is, uh, in my opinion, just incorporate every operating system you want. It will run under the virtual machine monitor and you, will, you can use the drivers of every operating system because you have a very operating system running on top of your machine. And also in the future, I would say whenever needed, uh, virtualization will become a key technology in privacy enforcement. I mean, uh, probably everybody of you know about the Sony case. <laughs> and uh, well, um, Imagine um, a future, a not so far away future, where the digital right management chain is closed. Meaning, you have a TPM chip, which is under control of the BIOS. You boot a certified operating system. Uh, and you're using certified drivers. And of course, this is the precursor to use your certified Blu-ray disc player and to play back your high definition television or whatever media. Um, you need to have that certified change uh, chain of digital right management. And of course, your graphic cards will have an HD uh, and, and a digital uh, output with uh, content protection. So basically you're screwed. Yeah? And uh, there is no easy way to work around it because uh, either you circumvent uh, the encryption, which is illegal, or you circumvent different other things, which is also illegal, or, well, you could virtualize the whole machine and uh, at the end you're writing in a virtual frame buffer and uh, <laughs> well, in a different operating system which is running uh, beside, you do whatever you want with it and it's not inflicting some um, digital right man management copyrights, you're not inflicting, you're not doing some bad uh, uh, breaking of uh, cryptography of right management and of course the operating system has no idea <laughs> what is going on and so has the digital right management. So in the future probably hopefully in the very past future or hopefully you don't need it but uh, full virtualization is uh, probably the key techno techno te whoops, technology <laughs> you can use uh, in a dark future where the digital right management chain is closed and you have no way to escape it except of virtualizing it. So. Well, I think this was it on my part. For people who are interested in the deeper techniques, I have some uh, references in my slides. You can download the slides, of course, from the wiki. And yeah, questions.
Okay. 